In September 2020, 36-year-old E. Lee was discovered severely beaten in Washington Park in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She was found undressed below the waist and later examinations revealed she had been sexually assaulted. Lee later died due to the blunt force trauma to her head. 17-year-old Kamari Lewis and 15-year-old Kevin Spencer emerged as the primary suspects and were charged with first-degree intentional homicide and first-degree sexual assault. A video on Lewis's phone showed the duo punching Lee while she was on the ground. One witness, initially claiming to be a bystander, later revealed he was present during the assault and provided a statement about the teenager's involvement. Another pivotal piece of evidence came from the mother who reported a video her son received via Facebook Messenger showing two boys assaulting a woman. Witnesses recounted that the teenagers approached Lee for money and upon her refusal escalated their harassment into violence. Lewis, however, attempted to downplay his involvement and suggested that Lee had consented to the sexual acts, a claim that was contradicted by the video evidence. Kamari Lewis was sentenced to 26 years in prison and 19 years extended supervision in June 2023. Kevin Spencer was sentenced to 32 years in prison and 20 years extended supervision in August 2023. On October 9, 2020, in New Boston, Texas, 21-year-old expectant mother Reagan Hancock and her unborn child Braxton Sage were brutally murdered. The killer, Taylor Parker, was an acquaintance of Reagan and her husband having taken their engagement and wedding photos. She had been faking her own pregnancy for months leading up to the murder, including doctored ultrasounds and having a gender reveal party, all in an effort to keep her boyfriend from leaving her. On the morning of the 9th, Taylor visited Regan at home, beat her in the head, and slashed her before cutting her abdomen open from hip to hip to remove her baby. Regan was still alive when Taylor left, but eventually died from her injuries. Her three-year-old daughter, Kinley, was also in the house, but was found hiding and unharmed. Taylor had taken Braxlin and sped away in her vehicle, but she was pulled over for speeding and driving erratically. The baby was found in her lap with its umbilical cord appearing to come from Taylor's pants in an attempt to make it seem like she'd just given birth. It was only when they were both taken to the hospital that the horrific reality started to emerge. Taylor was arrested and taken into custody and the baby did not survive. She was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death. On December 19, 1979, 18-year-old Michelle Martinko was brutally murdered in her parents' car in the West Del Mall parking lot in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. She had been stabbed 29 times in her face, neck, and chest. Michelle had gone to the mall that evening to purchase a new winter coat. When she wasn't home by 2 a.m., her father reported her missing. The police then found the car in the parking lot of a JCPenney. There were no fingerprints at the scene, and Michelle hadn't been robbed or sexually assaulted. The brutal nature of the crime seemed very personal to detectives. They followed up on hundreds of leads, but the case went cold for decades. In 2006, while examining the evidence, a cold case detective found unidentified blood believed to be the killer's. A DNA profile extracted from this blood was registered in the national DNA system but yielded no hits. In early 2018, the DNA information was uploaded to a public genealogy platform leading to a familial DNA connection. Later that year, DNA was discreetly gathered from an Iowa resident named Jerry Lynn Burns. It matched the DNA found on Michelle's clothing. Burns was arrested and eventually convicted of first-degree murder in Michelle's death. On August 7, 2020, Jerry was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. On April 21, 2022, Alex Eckert was found shot to death in his Minot, North Dakota home. The prime suspect in the investigation was 26-year-old Heather Hoffman, who was stationed at Minot Air Force Base and shared a child with Alex. They had been in a bitter custody battle, and a judge had recently ordered Heather not to restrict Alex from seeing their child. A 45 caliber shell casing was found at the scene of the crime, and Heather had recently purchased a 45 caliber gun at a local gun show. She was arrested and went on trial for murder. The prosecution showed that Heather had purchased one-way plane tickets for herself and her infant daughter, suggesting a plan to flee. They also stated that Heather had attempted to forge an alibi by manipulating the Life360 family tracking app. However, the defense put up a strong counterargument. They claimed that Heather was with her sister at the time of the shooting, which provided her with a solid alibi. They also introduced an alternate suspect, Jesse Schroeder, an acquaintance of Hoffman's. Witnesses testified they had seen Heather sell the firearm to Schroeder before the incident. On September 12, 2023, Heather Hoffman was found guilty of one count of felony murder. Her sentencing is scheduled for December 1, 2023. On August 2, 2006, 32-year-old lawyer Robert Wohn arrived at a townhouse in Washington, D.C. to spend the night with some friends due to some work commitments in the area the following day. The townhouse was owned by Robert's college roommate Joseph Price and was located in a well-to-do neighborhood. Price lived there with his partner Victor Saborski and another roommate Dylan Ward. Around 10.30 p.m., Robert emailed his wife Kathy saying that he had arrived safely. Later, the three roommates claimed to have heard a chime indicating that the front door had been unlocked and opened, followed by a grunt from Robert. When emergency responders arrived, they found Wone lying on a pull-out bed with three knife wounds to his chest. However, the crime scene seemed unusually clean for a stabbing. There were no signs of a struggle and Robert was found neatly placed on the bed with his clothes appearing to be undisturbed. Moreover, the knife next to his body was wiped clean of blood and it did not match the stab wounds. However, a different knife from a set in the kitchen appeared to match the wounds perfectly. Autopsy reports later revealed several puzzling details. The angle of the knife wound suggested that Wone had been incapacitated and was lying flat when stabbed. 
Additionally, needle marks were found on his neck, leading to speculation that he had been drugged. Furthermore, the lack of blood found at the scene suggested that his heart may not have been pumping when he was stabbed, indicating that he was likely already dead or incapacitated. Authorities also found it strange that none of the residents of the house had been injured, their stories had inconsistencies, and no evidence of forced entry was found. Although a door was supposedly unlocked, nothing in the home was stolen or even disturbed. In 2008, Price, Saborski, and Ward were charged with obstruction of justice, conspiracy, and tampering with evidence, although they were never charged with Wong's murder due to lack of sufficient evidence. The trial took place in 2010, and it focused heavily on the inconsistent statements made by the three men as well as the strange circumstances surrounding the crime scene. However, the defense argued that the prosecution failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the men had deliberately tampered with evidence or obstructed the investigation. The jury ultimately acquitted all three on the charges of obstruction of justice and evidence tampering. Despite exhaustive investigation and trial proceedings, the case remains unsolved. No one has been charged with the murder of Robert Wohn, and questions about what happened on that fateful night remain unanswered.